But I would like to, as an icebreaker, talk a little bit about conflict resolution. And if it is about you and you don't really want to say it's about you, you can say, I know a person who... And that's your way of sharing your situation. Conflicts arise. And some of us are better at handling conflict. More, I won't say confrontational, but not in a bad way. More like, okay, we need to get this thing under control. Because elsewhere in scripture it says that you should not go to bed angry. Especially at someone who is significant to you. But you should try to resolve that. So let's talk about conflict resolution in a kind way that can be helpful to the rest of the class. And I don't want to put anyone on the spot. You can always talk about another situation in another place rather than something that could come back to be, to have teeth and legs when you get home. (laughs) Um, Conflict and conflict resolution. What do you know about it? Either regular counsel or Christian counsel. One of my first appointments, I was the person who went around and tried to sue the feathers. Um, We had an officer in that appointment who was very dogmatic and would ball people out very easily for relatively little things. And I was the one who went around to smooth the feathers out deal with the problem and help them understand what he was trying to say in a better way. So I heard that some people are effective communicators and they might mean to say something but it comes across differently than Mm -hmm. they intend and they have not communicated because others who are not listening with the same ears that match the language they're speaking. Conflict resolution. Yes. Most of our kids live far away. And um, as I'm approaching a certain birthday, my goal is to meet with each of them and say to them, you know, I know you have a busy life and all this stuff is going on, but if there's anything unresolved between the two of us, now is your time. Why do you put it like that? Now is your time. Because as I'm getting older, I realize, you know, well, any age, you don't know if you have it tomorrow, but I want to make sure that all the kids, if they have any issues, for their sake, to speak to me about it so that I can give them comfort. So now it's their time doesn't mean that they can can't postpone it for a week or two. No, but, but because I don't see them very often, when I do see them, I just want to make sure everything is okay between us. A face-to-face. I think that's a key point is when there's distance between people, physical distance, physical distance, then it's easier to keep the conflict going because you can't communicate as well. Mm-hmm. Like that. Somebody else, please. When I get angry, you know, I say things and stuff like that that I shouldn't. You know, you get back and forth at each other, and so I try not to get that angry. Oh, yeah, I was uh, going to say, you know, years and years ago, uh, uh, when my first wife uh, and I separated, and that was uh, just just rough, uh, two, two sons that were uh, young. And so there was always that conflict uh, that, uh, that she would uh, generate. So now I'm a believer, and uh, I just felt the Lord, uh, especially the, the older one, uh, uh, I went and saw him one day and felt that I should tell him that, Ask his forgiveness in, for any way that I have messed up you know, in, in my relationship with him. And he helped me, and you know, we've been best friends ever since. Sometimes you try to resolve it, and you actually make the, the thing works in a way. Well, that's what I was going to say is that you mentioned, you know, somebody could be bullying or whatever. Well, they could claim to be a Christian and still be a bully. Yeah. Yeah. All believers are not equal. So that's a good point, even though the instruction is given. Within the community of believers, all believers are not equal, Mary. I think there's a, well, I know there's some people out there that they just live to be in conflict. I mean, they, <laughs> and, and, and in that case, well, I'm sorry, I didn't kid, but I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> and personally, when I come across a person like that, I don't, I don't necessarily avoid them, but I avoid some conversations but for me I don't even try to fix it because 
there, a lot of times there's just not any fixing. So I pray about it. I just ask God, you know, I know that what it, if they've done anything to me, I've forgiven them for it, and I just pray about it. Because sometimes there's just nothing you can do. I'm going to follow up there. So at what point do you forgive them about it when they've done something to you, but you know there is no instant resolution? When do you decide to forgive them? As soon as they injure you, or the next day, or the next year? When well, do you decide to forgive them? It depends on what they've done. Myself, I don't hold grudges. I, you know, things happen, they happen, and. Have you forgiven me? <laughs> what did you do to me? <laughs> <laughs> I usually take the coward's way out, <laughs> and uh, either I will think there really is no conflict there. Or I will say, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this conflict is minimal. And because it's minimal, then I just don't do anything about it. Yeah. Don't yeah. split the small but, stuff. But I, I rationalize by saying this really isn't a big deal at all. No. It was and very difficult to fight with. No fun. I know it's all fun. I lost mother. <laughs> From the eternal perspective, it doesn't <coughs> matter, and therefore you decide let it go. I think we've heard lots of good scenarios. Somebody who was longing to speak but wonders if I'll give you a chance, this is your chance. What about avoid conflict at all? Avoid. So say more. Oh, I mean, uh, just be patient, you know. Oh, be Christian? <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Our scripture tells us that we shouldn't do that. Avoid. Avoid the conflict. I'm going to start with the Matthew 18 passage. And you might not agree wholeheartedly with me, but here's what the Matthew 18 passage on the back of the handout says. Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Dealing with sin in the church. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan. Jesus is saying that avoiding the conflict is not the right way to go in the church. But I'm with you. And I wonder why it is said like this. So we need to discuss that and help me along with that. Because there are times that it makes things somewhat worse in the church. If it is not dealt with appropriately, you have to have conflict resolution skills. Otherwise you can split a church have the families go one side, they'll have to go the other side over some small, all for the want of a nail, and the horseshoe, the war was lost. Yes. This particular passage that you just read, though, isn't necessarily just conflict. It's saying that if you know of somebody that's doing any kind of sin, whether it's against you or somebody else, yeah. I mean, it's talking about sin in general, isn't it? But our topic today is conflict. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not in the context. But you're right, and truth be told, to respond to Mary, I would hazard a guess that many people know of stuff and sit there late. Yep. So we don't actually apply this because we don't want to make waves. Okay. Now this is why the passage particularly speaks to, let me read the first sentence again. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. I somehow thought it said if they sin against you. Maybe I'm wrong, or maybe a different translation says that. Any help from anybody? Mine says no, the NIV says, if your brother sins against you. Yeah, the old NIV. I don't know about the new NIV. But the old NIV. <laughs> okay. Somewhere in the context, I'm thinking if the sin against you, as opposed to the sin against someone else. Because if it is conflict resolution, and you're involved... If you have sinned against them, then this does not apply. If they have sinned against you, then it applies. 
And yes. it has to be a sin. And this talks about sin, which is what, an intentional or known transgression of the law of God. As opposed to a mistake. That's right. But if it's a mistake, you still want to tell them too. You know, you stepped on my toe accidentally. You didn't say pardon or sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So, yes. This whole uh, lesson stirs up so much trouble in my mind that I could almost have a nervous breakdown right here. Okay, let's change the subject today. <laughs> uh, I must not be very good at conflict resolution, but uh, I understand this, that one of my duties as a pastor when I was one, was to confront issues and not avoid them. And I did that quite often. With consequences. <laughs> huh? With consequences is what you're going to say. Yeah, it, it, I, there's more issues unresolved for me than there was resolution. And this, that makes it tricky, because even though the scripture might be saying how to handle it, you're saying, well, Lord, are you guaranteeing that the outcome will be a favorable one? I'm not sure there's a guarantee there. You bring other people in, you hope to get the resolution, but you make it, it, make it worse. It's a tough passage. Yes, yes, uh, Major Anderson reminds me that we had uh, a, a, a problem here, and uh, we got to have them for five, uh, five months as their parole officers. That worked out really good. <laughs> okay, so let me read from the top of the head. I remember once going to, my wife had a discipline issue with someone at camp. So, the it was the officer's son. And the officer got so mad at her and us that it disturbed the whole division. It wasn't when I was with you. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went to him, and it was a fiery uh, exchange, and he recorded secretly the whole darn conversation. <laughs> and finally, I just washed my hands of that, went home, and... That was the end of that relationship. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, man, I can go dozens of them. Excuse me. Well, don't have a heart attack today. <laughs> yes, Mr. Robert. When I was a young man, I quit practicing law for a large law firm for a while. And I had spent years anyway while I was in school working in the family business, construction company. And I grew up in an era when we did labor negotiations, People would sit at a table, swear at each other, pound on a table. And it was really, it almost got violent sometimes. And uh, my dad was a quiet man, a gentle giant. And uh, I remember being at a meeting with him. And he always avoided conflict. And uh, when you were a subcontractor to a general contractor working on a large project, when you exceeded... They ask you to do extra work beyond the contract. They sign a work order, and you give them a price. But typical with contractors, generals, at uh, some point in time, rather than pay you, they sit down and want to negotiate you down. So my reaction, I was at a meeting with my father, was pound the table, and I started swearing, and uh, you know, because they were trying to uh, take advantage of us. And uh, finally, my father pushed me down. He said, shut up. And then we walked out of the meeting. And uh, the contractor, the general contractor, got what he wanted in cutting the price. And my dad said, just keep your mouth shut. He already paid for it twice. <laughs> so that's how my father would avoid conflict. <laughs> Not exactly Christian, but... <laughs> but it's a valuable story because some of us have to think, well, okay, if there's any justice, you will pay for your sins and you get them too. See, we, we can't let pride get in our way. That's what I learned from that. My father was a wonderful teacher. Mm -hmm. You have to swallow your pride sometimes. Let the guy have his day. 
and you can laugh all the way home. <laughs> I have two versions of the handout for today because I put one song on and then this morning I kept thinking, that's not going to work. And I searched through an old edition of the songbook because the song that I was looking for is not in the new songbook. So the one you have should have that song and I put all four <laughs> verses there just because I think it can help us in our thinking. And I wish it were part of my thinking before this morning. Rosamund Eleanor Herklotz. She was the daughter of an Anglican priest. She was born in India. She lived from 1905 to 1987. That makes her 82 years approximately. Anyway, her song said, Forgive our sins as we forgive. You taught us, Lord, to pray. But you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. How can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart that broods on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart? In blazing light your cross reveals the truth we dimly knew. How small the debts men owe to us. How great our debt to you. Lord, cleanse the depths within our souls and bid resentment cease. Then reconciled to God and man, our lives will spread your peace. And the goal of the re reconciliation is to show the love of God. It is not about the other person. It's about your relationship with God. And these are just opportunities to shine the light and shame the devil. Yeah. To let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. And they might not, but the injunction is still there. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and God will get the glory. Even if nothing happens in the physical realm, God is glorified. Heavenly Father, you've given us instructions on how to deal with certain situations. And even if it is difficult for us to wrap our mind around, we pray that you will help us in our study today to come to a clearer understanding of how we ought to deal with these situations. And certainly that we should bring everything to you, as the songwriter says, if we are burdened with a load of care, that we can take it to you in prayer. Help us to remember this and give us the strength so that we can work through these conflicts and come to a resolution that is pleasing to you and that gives glory to you. Bless our time together and may we be encouraged by being here today for Christ's sake. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. This is interesting. And I wonder the background for Jesus to be telling this to his disciples. Does anyone recognize the passage we are focused on? Sermon on, Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount starts out, I think, with a small group. And other people coming, coming, and coming. But certainly it was directed towards his disciples. <coughs> My first question, in the Matthew 5 passage, Jesus shares steps that can make a difference in resolving conflict. In what ways does anger contribute in a conflict. So the conflict need not involve anger. You can have a conflict because of an innocent situation, a misunderstanding. What role does anger play? Anger clouds the mind, makes you not rational. It escalates the situation. Or it can create another conflict that happens. All good answers. I think sometimes uh, uh, people will t take that anger and uh, use it like, yeah, I've been wrong, you know, it makes them feel better. When you get angry, I feel like it, it kills part of that relationship. No matter how hard you try, that anger is always there. And it just kind of kills maybe just a little bit, but, enough, you know, part of this the relationship with the members you're dealing with. Like a slow poisoning. Yeah, yeah. Anger never resolves anything. It just leads to further conflict. And uh, getting angry or getting in a fight with somebody just uh, 
extends the conflict. Then it goes on and it goes on, and uh, it never brings it to an end. You have to be gentle. I'll give you one of my examples. Uh, when my dear wife and I were dating many, many years ago, his, uh, her former boyfriend would not, after she broke up, would not stop following her and harassing us both. And rather than get into a situation of conflict, he'd show up at every event we went to. It was terrible. And uh, one day, I, she made me stop going to my barber shop because uh, of all the gangsters that were there. <laughs> she was dating the manicurist. So I had to go to... Uh, <laughs> I had to go to a beauty shop and get my hair cut. So he walks into the beauty shop one day. So I figured I had to resolve this matter without anger or conflict. And this was my ponytail days, my Steven Seagal days. So I walked up to the, uh, the guy when he came in. I put my hands on his face and I kissed him on each cheek and I said, you come near my family again, you're dead. <laughs> so we totally resolved it. We never showed up. We resolved it without any conflict. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. 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 The word raka is the equivalent of calling somebody a fool. And it's an insult. It's worse than calling them a fool. But that's as much as I will say. It's an insult. What happens when conflict involves derogatory name calling or the putting down of another? We're not talking about anger now, we're talking about name calling. What happens when conflict involves derogatory name calling or the putting down of another? Well, the conversation ends basically of the trying to have resolution. Um, I think name calling is a distraction from the issue. You know, it's like someone doesn't feel like they're winning, so they start with the name calling, and it just it does the opposite of reconciliation. In the law, it's called ad hominem argument. It's Your the argument. coward's way out. Ad hominem is the coward's way out. Because they don't have to justify what they've done, they don't have to explain it, they just attack you for your person, not the issue. I think we nailed this one down, I can move on. Agree? Yes. Yeah. All right. Question number three. Question number three. What are your thoughts about making the first move to resolve a conflict? I think if you can do it, let, let your pride not get in the way. It's like bursting a water bottle. It's, you prick it, it's gone. Or diminished greatly. I'm having a hard time with this, this conflict resolution. I believe it's, it's good, but I just keep thinking to myself, the scripture says, Take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of the other person's eye. This is why I was proposing the conversation in the context of someone else wronging you. So that we are not dealing with your log anymore. <laughs> we're dealing with their speck. <laughs> you are absolutely right. But there are too many moving parts. Right. And therefore, the context I'm trying to propose for today is when someone has done something right. to you, that you are the bigger person. You know, that's one thing about officers, that I could never be an officer because <coughs> too old. that would be very hard for me to do. <laughs> Let me clue you. It's hard for the officers too. I think that many individuals in their own walk of life find a very challenging path. And sometimes being Christian constrains you because you right. keep thinking, I need to get even. Right, well, that's the, that's the human part, yeah. Recognition of your own areas of weakness is important, I think. Uh, my wife and I had a little tiff the other day. Just the other day. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, I had to go to a doctor's appointment, and I picked up a magazine. It was a secular magazine on marriage. And I read uh, three questions 
that really impressed me. The first one was, what is your purpose statement in marriage? Here, I've been married 62 years, and I don't have a purpose statement. The vows. Well, I got that. I got that. But I, it's not stated out of my own heart. I know what the... Okay, let's go on. The second question I love is, what principles of partnership do you both agree on? That's a good question to ponder. And the third one was, what can you do for each other that no one else can do? I really like those questions. So I came home, I wrote them down. I came home and I gave them to her. This is after our tiff. And I says, Joyce, why don't we think about this for a little while? I don't care if it takes you six months. Why don't you write a purpose statement for our marriage? Didn't I say that? So she's pondering that one. Anyway, what I'm getting at is the awareness of your own weaknesses. And I'm kind of an impulsive, quick on the draw type of person. That is a problem. Uh, I don't know. I'm true. <laughs> uh, yes. I have a thought. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, anger, actually, you know, in, uh, in, in this sort of thing. But if someone was, uh, and it, it was uh, not really, really bad, but it was bad enough, uh, someone would be uh, would mess with my daughter. Uh, I would stay angry with that person if uh, that person didn't get himself straightened up and that anger would be used uh, in a positive way right. to make sure there was a resolution. So uh, so I don't know if that's the, if that's the correct word, that the, that the anger can, can fuel, fuel uh, you in a positive way or, or, or something else. But, uh, but, but that feeling, you know, that uh, works wonders sometimes. <laughs> Question number four. <laughs> Jesus shows how serious he is about conflict resolution by making it a priority before you give a gift or offer a prayer. Verse 23 says, If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. And then come and offer your gift. Remember the Old Testament context. You went to Jerusalem for the Day of Atonement. And nine days before you offered your gift, you were supposed to resolve all the conflicts you had with other brothers. Find the other brothers with whom you had a wrong, an ought. And then offer your gift. Some of us would never offer a gift. Because we don't want to do that conflict resolution thing. But this, but this was mandated. This is where we have done something, but we know that we've done something against somebody else, as opposed to they have done something against us. Is that what it's yeah. Yeah. This is where has something we against you. Something. Mm -hmm. So it's well, kind of turning yeah. around, you know. So yeah, we should be. We should always be trying to be aware of when we've offended or hurt somebody else or done something wrong and, and attempt to reconcile with that person. I think a lot of times we don't even know though. I mean, well, they're I saying that you remember. remember. If you don't remember, yeah. then you... I think that question four is very similar to question three. And uh, it shows the person who you are in conflict with that you are concerned. In the case of question three, you are showing the individuals that uh, you're lowering your guard and hopefully they in turn will proceed in the same direction. I think strategically it's an excellent move. And question four, similarly, the leaving of the gift at the altar and then going to make amends or to make up and then coming back to the altar is showing the same thing. And I think it could be very successful in resolving conflict and bringing people back together. 
Anyone else? How do you I think? I think it depends on what the conflict is and how many people know about the conflict and what you're going to do about it. Why had a conflict with a DC? And in front of a big group of people, I apologized to him and told him I was wrong in the way I responded. I had to do it before I could move on with my with being an officer. I had to do that. And he's the one that invited you there. <laughs> that wasn't you. <laughs> Question number five. How does reconciliation with another person clear your heart for prayer, worship, or service? Yes. There's a life principle I've learned that goes like this. Fight all your battles on your knees Amen. and you win every time. Amen. 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 Prayer changes things. And people, too. Question number six says that sometimes conflict requires legal resolution. This is not my question. This is the curriculum guy's question. Why should a Christian follow a high standard when it involves legal resolution? First of all, do you understand the question? It's implying that when you go to the court to resolve something legal, that the Christian should take the high road in resolving this issue. So they say, why should the Christian follow high standard when it involves legal resolution? I almost didn't ask the question because I think there's so much haze around the question. Of course, as a Christian, you want to take the high road. Well, let me not say of course. Sometimes you want to say, let me get the best attorney who will fight the case for me so that I can win the case. Because sometimes taking the high road means that you give in and you don't get a fair judgment. On your part, especially if it's a negotiated settlement, you allow someone to win, so to speak, especially in an organization that doesn't like to go to court. Yes, I would say that by taking following the high standard, it means taking all those steps prior to having to go to court mm -hmm. you know, the one on one, and then having witnesses and, and try to go through the process. So, going to court would be a last resort. Excellent. Excellent. Any other practical experiences that might come to mind? Any stories? The only thing that comes to my mind is the phrase that it, it's legal, isn't it? But is it the right thing to do? Love that. Love that. So, as a principle in life. We're open to saying it's legal, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right or proper thing to do. And we are talking about circumstances that do involve legal conflict. But you might still want to, as Mary suggested she does, forgive the person if you are the one who is wronged in this conflict. And uh, does the high road mean that you don't pursue your legal right? <coughs> Because our context is among Christians, raises interesting questions because, as we said, all believers are not equal. Just because someone claims to be Christian doesn't mean that they will fight fairly or use the use the principles, the biblical principles. Yes. Most uh, conflicts that arise to that situation that you're discussing cannot be resolved on, on their own between the parties. I mean, if you're dealing with a large corporation, they won't even talk to you. That's true. You need someone to come between you and the accusers. And uh, are you going to forgive the large corporation? I mean, frankly, who cares? I mean, they're out to get in your pocket, and uh, you need somebody to go between you and them because they're not going to talk to you. In the case of a criminal matter between a citizen and yes, you can forgive them, and you can look to God, but you should pursue legal action in a criminal matter. Uh, and I'm talking physical violence, things like that. 
because only the law has the capability of resolving them. If you're dealing with murder, with physical violence, and you forgive that person and not report it, they're just going to go on and do it to somebody else. So I think it's your obligation to your fellow man to pursue legal action in those situations. Uh, but you can privately forgive that individual. It's between That's between you and, your, and the Lord. When I was stationed in Chicago, there was a story in the paper about a lady whose son was murdered. And um, by another teenager that was about his age, she took it on as her responsibility to go and visit this young man because there was nobody else. <coughs> he basically grown up with a with no parents. Um, he was living with his mother, but she was not a parent. Um, she took it on herself to go and visit with this young man, and was became his substitute mother, taught him right from wrong while he was in prison, but was there for him for the whole time. Yet, this was the young man who murdered her son, and quite violently. Um, that was the best illustration of Christian love that I have ever remained, rem remembered seeing. Even in smaller situations, mm -hmm. when people wrong you, yeah. you say, okay, I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to be loving towards you. Yeah. And it, I guess it's supposed to do something good for your heart. <laughs> but it can take a long time because... <laughs> it, it was one of... It, I'm sure there are other things that have been going on, you know, but this one hit the paper. Yeah, this... And because it was so unusual. I had it. A, a similar situation just like that one and the mother forgave the son for what he did what he did to her daughter but in, at the time I thought how in the world could anybody forgive somebody for doing something like that but as I grew in my relationship with, with Christ I understand that now I wasn't put here to judge anybody, and it hurts my heart that you did what you did, but I'm not going to judge you, or I will try not to judge you. I'm not going to won't. <laughs> I would, because nothing like that ever happened to me, so I don't know what I would do, but I would hope that I would, I could say I wasn't here to judge. You're the one that's going to have to stand for the... Forgiveness does not mean there will not be consequences. Right. And, the Bible teaches that principle. <laughs> and and, and um, many times there can be forgiveness, but someone may have to pay a price because of what has been done. There's yes. a legal system which is supposed to help you know to, to do that. Right the wrongs. For That's visits right. were in prison. But, but I mean, but I mean, there are, there are consequences. We may we may forgive our brothers and sisters. But there could be consequences to the deeds that have been done, which have uh, caused the forgiveness to uh, you know, provoke the forgiveness. And this is a personal question, not related to the lesson directly. If someone wrongs you and you say, I forgive you, and your heart is not in it, you're just saying it so that you can move on, have you done a terrible thing? By Verbalizing forgiveness when your heart is not <coughs> necessarily there yet. Yes. We talked about faking it till we make it last. We <laughs> 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 not here. <laughs> no. uh, yes. The answer is yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think you need to attempt to address the issue. I remember one time I had a conflict with someone who I f perceived was living in sin. And they shared the same platform with me. And I says, I had to go to them and I said, we can't be on the same platform at the same time. And he listened to me. And today that person is one of my best friends. That was resolved. I read 
I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Sometimes I listen to other preachers who are not necessarily Armenian Wesleyan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, you do what? Our denomination's oh. theology. Okay. <laughs> More like all sacks, what they go and say, okay, okay. Because you like them, they're eloquent. And apparently the guy recently was outed. And it breaks your heart because sometimes you find you're worshiping the person. You look up to the person so much. When you hear that the person has done this thing that they shouldn't do and still are preaching, you keep wondering, how does the Lord, I don't want to say bless, but I guess he uses the imperfect person to reach people, but the person is living a behind-the-scenes life, a double life. But they're preaching every Sunday and eloquent, and people love to hear them preach. And it breaks your heart, and then you realize that some people are just smooth, very good talkers, gifted, but their, li their private lives disappoint you. I'm not sure where I'm going with that, but I was just saying that it was heartbroken, because I like the person. And it breaks your heart when you find that this person that you like, you look up to, is living a life that is sinful. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, yes, sorry. I was going to say, I, can, I don't know how necessarily, you know, if you approach somebody else that you've wronged and you say you're sorry, and depending on whether they're a Christian or not, they may or may not accept it or whatever. I, I did have a situation that happened to me when I was working where... Evidently, one of the judge's secretaries said, said that they've done something to me, and she came to me in my office and said, I'm sorry. She came right to me and said it, and we hugged, and it's like, I know I must have totally forgiven her, because I don't even remember what happened. I don't, all I remember is her coming to me and saying, I'm sorry. That's all I remember. Any other? Okay. I almost don't want to deal with the next passage because it involves the church and how the church handles or mishandles situations. And in the situation I mentioned, other people in the church defended the person, even though the person was wrong. In other words, they gave the person the benefit of the doubt. When the accusers said what they said, people said, that can be true. And they sided with the person they looked up to and adored. And the people who make the accusation were treated like pariah, like you've just done something terrible to our favorite person, when the person was telling the truth. So we get these difficult situations where you almost want someone to be perfect because you look up to them. And then you realize they're regular human beings. And unfortunately, it happens. So the question number eight said, how might the church make reconciliation possible without ignoring sinful behavior? When any person must be brought before church authority to respond to sinful behavior, the goal should be even more critical. How might the church make reconciliation possible without ignoring? It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I said I almost don't want to go into this passage because I think many churches just avoid the conflict. Mm -hmm. And you wait for things to get worse, like the story I told, before we do anything. So, even the principle of going to the brother, and many people would not want to walk, a lay person wouldn't walk, walk to the pastor and say, you know, uh, there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. Because other people will side with the pastor. Especially if the person is personable. And you are not personable. So that creates a terrible situation. And again, I know this can be hurtful to many individuals to have to relive pain that they've gone through, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Question number nine. We often apply verse 19 to prayer. Verse 19 of Matthew 18 says, Truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. 
the original context is important. But when we think of this, we think of if there's a small gathering, that God will be in the midst of a small gathering. That's not the context in which the passage was given. It was in the context of dealing with sin in the church. How about your understanding of this first change when you consider that it comes out of a context of conflict resolution? Would you still want to apply it to the context of, hey, a small group gets together, God is going to be in the midst? Yes, but the context is that there is sin in the church. I just have a question because this, this verse has been on my heart for a week now, and I don't understand it, and maybe somebody can explain it to me. I've always felt like even when I'm by myself, God's with me. Mm-hmm. Again, look at the context. The context is dealing with sin in the church. That's but, what But when he says for for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. That I mean he's with me all the time, right? Even when I'm alone. So I don't necessarily have to be with two or three people for him to be okay. And that's why the context is important. Yeah. Text with no and, context. And you it, take it out of context it, and you view it as though it's related to when you're praying but that's not the context. The context is it's when there's a problem in the church. It's just funny that it, I mean, it has been on my heart for... Isn't it when two or three people are together praying, you're looking for the guidance from the Lord? Mm-hmm. Is what you're saying there is what that really is, at least to me. Yeah, well, I'm saying that if you put in the context that Jesus originally said it, it was when there's a conflict. Right. And uh, we don't know, we usually take it out of context, and that's what I was trying to bring back here, that... The fact that most people see it out of the context, and now it's in the context, doesn't change anything. We also need to be careful who the two or three are. Right. That's why we're speaking about the witnesses. And you want to get the right people as witnesses to resolve that conflict. I think we're going to wrap up there and uh, try to get our hearts set on the fact that conflicts will arise. And sometimes, maybe this lesson might change very little in the way you deal with conflicts. I certainly need to think about it a lot. Will it change how I deal with conflicts? Because conflicts can be ongoing. And just because you forgive someone doesn't mean that they will not come a second time and do the same thing. I think a few weeks ago I asked and Ellen said, No, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I will not let you do the same thing to me twice. So we need to be wise as serpents while we are harmless as doves. But certainly think about conflicts, whether they are conflicts between two individuals or conflicts in the church. Again, I'm not big on dealing with conflicts in the church because someone with a greater authority than I probably is better positioned to deal with that. And I don't want to stir anything that should not be stirred. Lord, we thank you for the chance to study how we ought to deal with certain circumstances, especially when we have been wronged that we let our light shine, that others seeing us will see Jesus. May we remember this and be slow to speak and quick to forgive. Give us the patience so that we can cope with these circumstances and help those who come into conflict with us to see that we are indeed striving to please you. May our lives be good examples and may you be pleased with the way we live our lives. Bless our time together and as we go into a worship service, we pray that you will visit with us And bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.